Hey y'all, hey, welcome back. I'm so glad to have you guys here with me today. Um, Today's topic is going to be less like structured and more like let's have a talk Um, because I felt (laughs) compelled to do this video after just, you know, talking to multiple people on social media and just comments and other people that like my mentees and whatnot. Um, And I found a common type of, struggle that I feel like we all have faced, especially as entrepreneurs or at least solopreneurs, um, is the internal struggles that we face when it comes to finances and money, just as a business owner. I feel like there's a lot of internal battles that we we go through, which is what leads to burnout and what leads to just depression, entrepreneurial depression. It's a thing. Look it up. Um, there's a lot that goes on internally. And I, For me, I just want to speak on my experiences. Um, And if you can relate, by all means, let me know down in the comments below. Um, I just, I'm just compelled to share my story. So let's get started. So I want you to think why you feel like you face so many internal struggles when it comes to building your business. Now, based on my own personal experiences, I feel like these are the three main reasons we go through the struggles that we go through as entrepreneurs. Um, number one, I, I strongly believe entrepreneurship is a spiritual journey more than anything. And if you are not, number one, if you've always struggled with spirituality, if you struggled with who you are as a person, if you've always struggled with just like not knowing your identity and who you are, that's going to be a, a, that's going to raise a lot of conflict in when you start building your business, it's going to arise, it's going to come out. Number two, you are trying to operate your business from a place of scarcity or survival. Um, That is something that I can relate to as well that I didn't realize was passed down from my parents. And we'll get into that um, in a little bit. But the way we were raised, the things that we were raised off of, we didn't realize um, our caretakers or our parents were passing down these generational traumas to us, even though it doesn't seem like, you know, such a big thing. But if you're raised with, you know, with thinking that, um, you always need to take, take, take and get, get, get and go out and hustle, that is coming from a place of scarcity. And, um, unfortunately it's what our, you know, people had to go through to survive, right? They were in survival mode. Um, and I'll get into that when I tell my story about my parents. And number three, relationship with money and finances are strained. You don't view money as a tool. You view it as a need, um, like a bare necessity. And that also comes from, you know, kind of like your environment, what you were raised on, how the people that raise you, what, what you were taught about when it comes to finances and money. So it may not be necessarily because of you. It was just the people that were raising you that, you know, thought that way was the right way, but it actually wasn't. So let's get more into number one, why entrepreneurship is more of a spiritual journey than anything. So I really got, I really, this revelation came to me right after I lost my shop. And it was at that point that I realized how lost I was. So just a little backstory, because there's so many different levels to me losing my shop and I might get, I might not go too deep into this video because it will end up being a super long video, but I will touch on three things that had me empty. I was empty spiritually. I was empty mentally and I was empty physically. Like I literally had nothing left to give when that happened to my business. I like reached a point where I lost who I was in my identity, uh, which is crazy because I started this journey with God. Like I, I I grew up in the church and, you know, I've learned along the ways of how religion is just not what it's all cracked up to be. I consider myself a spiritual person. I am in touch with God and um, I have a relationship with God. So when I say spiritually, I don't mean like, you know, I I was raised on strict religious rules and that's just, it just doesn't work for me now. Um, But I started my journey into business and entrepreneurship with God. I just got so lost along the way doing all the things that needed to be done in the business when it came to like employees, taxes, you know, business licenses, landlord issues. Like there were just so many things that I was taking on myself and I was not giving it back to God, not realizing that he was the reason why I was there in that in the first place. I started to be more absorbed with I, 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 me as Merlene, me as myself, not as 
the, the person that God ordained me to be. So I lost myself along that way. So by the time I lost my shop, yes, I had broken even. Yes, I was finally out of the, the hole. We finally like were out of the out of the red, in the black, but who I was as a person was not there anymore. I literally lost my identity and it's because I lost my journey in myself with Christ. Like I, I, I forgot all about that relationship. I wasn't praying anymore. I wasn't meditating. I wasn't putting him first. I wasn't putting all of my issues and problems on the altar. Like I literally absorbed all that. And of course I lost my shop. Like it makes sense now in hindsight why that happened. It was the biggest blessing that happened to me. Um, and I can go into more details on another video, like I said, but I'm not going to go too deep on this one. So the first step I think we all need to realize is that entrepreneurship is more of a spiritual journey than anything. It is going to test you in ways and put you in positions where your spirituality will be put into question, whether or not for yourself or other people. But if you don't get back in touch with who you are as yourself, who created you, what your purpose is, it, it is so much deeper than us, this journey. Um, it's easy to, you know, and I, I hate to say like, it's easy to have a nine to five. I don't mean that in the sense of the physical work and the stuff that's being done. I mean that in the mental capacity in the in the spiritual capacity, because when you're putting yourself out there as an entrepreneur, you're putting literally yourself out there. You're blood, work, sweat, and tears. Um, as opposed to a 95, you can just clock out and you're done for the day. It's, there's never a done as a business owner. So I think that's the first realization we need to sit with is that this is a spiritual journey. I am on a journey, not a race, not a marathon, a journey, meaning it's always going to forever be changing. There's always going to be things to come and challenge you in ways you've never been challenged before. Number two, let's get into why I believe um, a lot of people are operating from a place of scarcity. Um, you know, before getting into entrepreneurship, it just sounds like, you know, it's I don't want to say it sounds easy. It just sounds simple enough. Like, OK, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. This is what I plan on doing. This is how much money I plan on making. But um, a lot of people don't realize when you start, like especially coming Oh, this is hard. So you know what? I'll just speak on where I came from, my point of view. Um, I didn't realize when I was being raised, like my mom was actually a financial advisor. So she had the financial literacy and the financial uh, knowledge of how to uh, utilize money as a tool. And that's something that she raised me off of, which is why I feel like I was already kind of a step ahead because I didn't realize what I was learning growing up was financial literacy. It just was common knowledge because it was something that my mom was teaching me, um, like 12, 11 years old. So I knew the concept of money and how to utilize it to flip it where I feel like the scarcity came up was, okay, so I'm uh, Haitian American. I'm first generation Haitian American. My, both of my parents were uh, ha Haitian immigrants to this country. So when they came here, they came here with just a suitcase, with nothing. And my goodness, they made such a great life coming up so much so that we didn't even feel the effects of that. Now as an adult, I realized how much they sacrificed and how much, how hard it was for them to leave everything they knew behind to come to a new land and start new, brand new. So for me, I feel like there's no reason why I should not maximize on my potential here, on not only on this earth, but here in this country, right? So, um, but here's the thing about scarcity. You never realize how you're in it until you really learn about it and then you look back. So there were certain things that my mom did what she could have done. And I realized it was because of a place of scarcity because she had never touched that much money before. So when my mom was starting to make money in her business and she started to like invest in different things, she wasn't flipping the money the way she could have been because she hesitated because she said, well, what if this doesn't work? What if this doesn't happen? And that comes from a place of scarcity because you don't know what you don't know until like it's too late. Right. And you know, for her, She's working hard, doing the things, working the American dream and getting like the money to, you know, put in, get, build her house and do all that. But when it came time to like flip that money, she didn't, she saved it. And it's not to say there's nothing wrong with saving money. It's just a matter of at what point do you save so much until you invest back in to flip it, to make more money. 
And that's something that even now when we talk, she tells me, she was like, man, I should have invested this. I should have invested that. If I like, we have these conversations often because I talk to my mom every day and she always talks about how she should have invested in land and she didn't like, she just didn't take it a step further. And for me, I'm like, oh, say less. Now that I know these things, I'm not only learning from her, but I'm also breaking the mindset, breaking the scarcity mindset of when the money comes, it's not for me to hold on to and to, I don't want to say hoard because, you know, I'm never going to knock somebody for saving money, right? But what I'm saying is flip it so that it can continue to make more money. That's something that she just didn't want to take that risk on. Um, and of course it is a bigger risk, of course, but the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. Like if she would have bought lots of property back then, that's one thing we always talk about buying like prop, like land. She would have bought that back then. We would have all been chilling on having our own compound, but that's okay. Cause we're going to break that cycle with me. <laughs> I always tell people I, I made a pop, a uh, I made a thread post and it was like, I um, believe hustling and grinding comes from a scarcity mindset, which I still strongly believe it does because my parents came like literally had nothing when they came here. They had to hustle and they had to grind to get what they had. Not to say that it's bad or wrong, but it's from a place of lack. It's from a place of not having. That's where that comes from. Grinding and hustling comes from a place of not having it. It's just like textbook definition of what it is. And let's get into the last point before we get too far off here. Number three, your relationship with money and finances are strained. So this, I feel like comes from how we grew up with our thought processes around money. Now, like I said, I grew up in church. I grew up like a super strict Haitian Baptist church where, um, you know, a lot of things that were taught to us and told to us about the Bible and about, you know, God, it just was kind of mis it was a misconception. Like it was misrepresented. He was really misrepresented to us, especially growing up, which is why I was always that rebel child that questioned everything. I still do, and I still teach my kids to do so. Um, which kind of drives me nuts sometimes. But it's okay. Um, because they're going to have the capacity to know to ask questions when something doesn't seem right. So I feel like growing up, we were told a lot about, you know, money is evil. Rich people are evil. It's harder for a rich man to enter the gates of heaven. You know, like those type of things that were told to us. And, and that Bible quote, I'm gonna look it up real quick. Hold on. Okay, I found it. I had to go looking on my tablet. So I, I, want, I don't want to misquote or misrepresent in any way. Um, so Matthew 19, um, verse 24. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. That's what the verse says. So wait a minute, guys. Hold on. Sorry. Now I don't went back up a little bit to read the whole passage because this is another thing that the church tends to do is read one part of a section and run with it. So I'm going to read from the beginning. Um, Matthew 16 is where it starts of when this is actually Jesus talking. I didn't anticipate for this to turn into a Bible study, but hey, let's get into it. Why not? The rich young man. And behold, this is Matthew 19. Um, verse 16, and behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what should I still lack? I'm sorry, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, this is the verse. Truly, I say to you, only with difficulties shall a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. 
When his disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus said to them, looked to them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So I feel like when we look at that whole like verse, like before and after in reference of why he said what he said is because that man came to him saying, well, I do this, I do that. Like what I've done all these things. What else should I do? And he's like, if you feel like you perfect, go sell your stuff. Then I think what, what I got from that was that when with great riches comes the pride and the ego, and that is where you're going to get tripped up right? Because that's sin. Pride and your ego being so big that you lose sight of what's important. And this is a part of my story where I feel like this is what happened with my business. I lost sight of why I was doing what I was doing. I lost myself. I lost my identity. And it's, it's always rooted in Christ. It's always rooted in God. So when you lose that, whether I feel like anybody can lose it. I wasn't even rich back then. I was touching a little bit of money, but I wasn't rich. So I feel like God had to take it away. He was like, give it, give it back, give it back, give it back. Cause I gave you, we worked together to get to this point. And then you lost your way. You lost me. You like our relationship was like almost non-existent. Like I still knew he was there, but it was definitely on the back burner. He was in the back seat of the car. He wasn't in the driver's seat. I was in the driver's seat. He was in like the trunk. Uh, like if we're going to use analogies, so with that being said, um, gosh, I miss, I don't even know where I, I was going with this. Oh, the relationship that we have with money. Um, this is why they say the love of money is the root is all, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. That is why I feel like the Bible says that is because when you love something outside of, outside of what is the fruit of the spirit, you're going to be in a dangerous game. You're playing a dangerous game and that could be anything guys. Yeah, the love of money is the root of all evil. But once you start putting too much emphasis and too much focus on certain things of the world and not of God and of Christ, we going down a slippery so slope. So I feel like, um, like I was saying, we were taught all these things when we were growing up um, to look at money as inherently evil. But it's it's a tool. It's a resource. Um and there were riches in the, there were people, Solomon was, was beyond like wealthy, sick, wealthy. So it's not to say like rich people can't get into heaven. It's their part posture. It's their heart posture where you stand. How are you? Is the wealth ruling you? Is the money ruling you? Or are you using that as your gift to gift the world and live in your purpose? Just my thoughts, just my two cents. I kind of went off on a little tangent there, um, but I'm okay with it. Um, so to wrap up, this is why I um, am now living by and honoring the be, do, have model. You have to become the person you want to be. Like when you reach that next level or when you reach your highest level, you have to be that now. You have to become the person. The input is becoming and then doing is the having. So when you start becoming the person that like 10 years now from you, when you, you're at like the peak level that you like your goals that you want to be at, when you're at your peak level, 10 year you needs to be there now. That's the person that's going to do the work and put in the work to make your business work and be successful and thriving in 10 years. So you have to become to do in order to become to do. So the, the output is the doing when you become. And then the doing being the input is the have. You want to have all these things. You want to have all this money. You want to have all this abundance and joy and happiness. First off, joy comes from self, number one. So you, you're you chasing happiness and joy, but it's already here. You have to choose that every day. This is why practicing your gratitudes every morning is so imperative. As a business owner, you have to operate from a higher, a higher level of self. You have to already be the person you're going to become or that you want to be 10 years from now in order to have that, what that person has. Because if a million dollars fell in your lap right now, you wouldn't know what to do with it. You would squander it and you would waste it away unless you already became the person you need to become to be a millionaire. Then now it's just a matter of doing in order to have. Um, and that teaching came from Myron Golden. Um, I'm going to also put his information down here so you guys can reference him because he is my unofficial mentor. <laughs> um, but yeah, 
I think that's all I have for now. Um, this ended up being a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, but let me know if this resonated with you. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. If you like what I'm talking about, if you feel what I'm dropping and also hit that notification bell so that you can get notified notifications on when we drop new episodes every Monday morning. Um, guys have a blessed day. I'm so happy you guys are here and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.